Hi, Pat. Uh, Kendall here. I'm one of your latecomers. Hello, Kendall. Lovely to hear your voice. Hey, great to great to great to hear your voice too. Okay, we're at one minute after the hour. I think we'll get underway. Uh, you'll find that you're muted or you're about to be muted so that we don't get any background noise. Um, just so you're prepared for not being able to speak, uh, there is an opportunity for you to participate using the chat function. So, My name is Pat Atherton. I'm with the BC Support Unit and we welcome you to this webinar here on October 23rd, 2017 on the Rewarding Success Initiative for the province of British Columbia. I'd like to begin this webinar by acknowledging the traditional territories of the Musqueam, Salwatoot, and Squamish nations from whose traditional lands we are leading this meeting today. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and will be available on our website, bcsupportunit.ca, under resources, so you can share it with your friends and colleagues. Uh, and I, it's my pleasure now to introduce you to the BC Support Unit's Executive Director, Minnie Downey. Minnie, over to you, please. Thank you, Pat, and uh, welcome everybody uh, for joining us for this webinar today. Um, the purpose of this webinar is to provide you background information on the Rewarding Success Initiative uh, with, within the BC context. Uh, we're very excited to be partnered with the Canadian Institute for Health Research through the SPORE initiative to be able to offer this to uh, BC. Uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, guest presenters today. We have uh, Jessica Nexogel calling from Montreal who is representing CIHR and SPORE. We have Heather Davidson, Assistant Deputy Minister of uh, British Columbia Ministry of Health, and Chad Lanay, uh, Program Delivery Peer Review Team for the CIHR, and he's coming from Ottawa. Uh, Jessica is going to give us uh, an overview of the Rewarding Success Initiative and Heather will go over the four priority areas for uh, British Columbia and Chad will go into details about how to apply for the Rewarding Success as a BC re researcher. Uh, and then I will give a little bit of an overview of what type of services the support unit can provide. Then we'll have a question and answer uh, period to address anything that hasn't come up uh, through the presentation. And I will hand it over to Jessica. Jessica, I'm just going to pass you the presenter ball so that you're able to share your slides. All right, Pat, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you just fine. Oh, okay, great, thank you. Great, um, perfect. Perfect, so I will just do a little bit of an overview of this initiative and I'll begin with um, giving just a little bit of context around what this is and, and why we're doing this and then get into a little bit of how we design the initiative and then um, the phases and how it will roll out. So this is a slide that was actually taken from the most recent Commonwealth Fund survey. And what you see here is that there were 11 OECD countries that they looked at. And on average, Canada spends about the same amount as the other countries in terms of, of healthcare costs. So for Canada in 2016, that was $228 billion Canadian, and it was 11% of Canada's GDP. But where we don't do so well is in terms of our performance. And you can see here, Canada was actually below the average, so we were ranked ninth out of the 11 countries. And you can see the U.S. was, was really um, the worst in terms of spending as well as performance, and they're all the way off the right on the side. But we really need to think about how we can improve the value for our investment. We're, we're putting in the same amount, but we're not getting the same out of um, our system. So we started thinking about this and, and how, how we could do this. What, what can we change? Where can we make a difference? 
And what we start to think about is, well, we need to think about new approaches um, and maybe new ways to partner, incentivize innovation, and, and how do you really, really do that, and are we doing it well? And when we started thinking about it, we thought, well, we know when you think about peer review and, and most conventional peer review committees are really reluctant to support riskier innovation. They tend to um, look at things more like feasibility over being more creative and innovative. And we know how much time it takes for for people to partner, and that's a lot of time and effort, and is it being rewarded? Well, in some ways, yes, is um, you partner and then you implement things into the healthcare system and it works and, and there's publications, but are there other types of reward systems that, you know, would, would benefit all different types of partnerships and, and different partners involved? So just thinking about that. And we started to look at different funding models and other mechanisms that were used um, in other places to foster innovation. So uh, one of the most common ones are, are prizes, and this is um, done a lot in Europe, where a funding agency will put out a call and they're really looking for the best solution to a particular problem. So one example for this was looking at low-cost point-of-care testing for viral versus bacterial upper respiratory tract infections. And just the best solution ends up ends up winning, and, and that's how that's done. And then there's the risk sharing, and this is really done for new technologies or new drugs that haven't necessarily proven their effectiveness. So then you may have the company that develops the drug kind of partner with an insurance agency where they both kind of share the risk. And then the last was social impact bonds, and these are really used to, to tackle big societal challenges and often done when uh, government won't or doesn't necessarily have the funds or can't support a particular program. So then they would bring in a separate party, so let's say a charity or a philanthropic organization to come in and pay for a particular program to be implemented. And then if it's successful, um, the government will come back and pay that those funds, um, and success. So well, none of these three models are really, can't, couldn't really work in our uh, circumstance, but perhaps we can take different, um, you know, different pieces of these and build something else, which is really what we did. And we built this rewarding success model, and how, um, how this works is that you have a multidisciplinary team that consists of a researcher, a clinician, a patient, and a decision maker from a healthcare delivery organization. And they would partner with a payer organization. And the payer could be the Ministry of Health or a regional health authority or even a, a charity um, or philanthropic organization. And together, uh, what this team and the payer will do is they'll agree on a particular idea on how to improve value for investment in healthcare. They will determine the outcomes and the metrics to be measured. They will determine the value and the timing of the payback, and then get into the nitty gritty of developing the contracts and agreements that would outline uh, all the details I just mentioned. And then once this is done, the team would go on to actually implement the intervention or particular program into the health, uh, healthcare uh, delivery organization. And this would be done using innovative clinical trial methodology. And this particular intervention should improve health outcomes, produce healthcare cost savings, and or uh, health delivery efficiencies. And throughout the entire time that this is being implemented, there will be an evaluation of the in intervention, and this would be done Funded independently by a third party. And at the end, if agreed upon outcomes are achieved, the savings will be redistributed between the payer, the team, and or redirected into an innovation fund. And, and that would all be determined within those contracts and agreements that had been done previously. So we knew that this was something pretty different and um, we were really piloting the idea and we thought, well, if we want it to be successful, 
then we may want to split our rewarding success into different phases and kind of work with the teams throughout the different phases to make sure that it's a success. So this first phase is the idea of rephrase, and I'm sh sure everyone that's, that's listening is very well aware this is the current phase that we are in. So it's, it's basically like a letter of intent where you have the opportunity to outline um, your particular idea using uh, the rewarding success model. So we're looking at innovative ideas that enhance value-based care or novel ways to spread and scale. And your idea should really address one of the BC priorities that were listed within the funding opportunity. However, you can also, um, if you have another idea that you think is a pretty high priority, you're more than welcome to submit that as well. And in the idea brief, just explain why you think that this should be a priority for BC. These idea briefs will then be uh, submitted to CIHR. But what we are actually doing is then handing them back to the provinces for the review. So that's really going to be done at the provincial uh, level. Each province will review their own idea briefs and they will get to select the top five um, to then go on to the ideathon. So that's the next stage. So the ideathon is February 6 to 7, and it will be a, obviously a two-day national event. So all the, each of the five teams that have been selected by their province to attend will be um, invited to go to the ideathon to pitch their actual idea. So out loud to an idea panel. There will be no additional um, written application at this stage. Uh, for the ideathon, uh, you can also apply in the idea brief for a $2,500 uh, travel award to help support your travel. And we are saying that up to two team members plus one pair should be present at the ideathon. So I highly suggest anyone that's um, looking to submit an idea brief, at least um, kind of block these two days now so that they're kind of held off, hold off, held off sorry, in your, in your calendar. And then what will happen at the Ideathon is, like, like I said, you will be able to pitch the, the idea. And the idea panel will actually select the top two pitches from each province to be awarded a business case um, development grant. And now that we are only, there are four provinces that are involved, but there are enough funds for 12, sorry, for 10 business case development grants. What we are doing are, so there are at least two uh, for each province. And then the next two most highly ranked pitches from two differing provinces will be awarded a uh, business case as well. So just to, to clarify that, it'll be the top two in every province, and then there will be another two provinces that will each get a third uh, business case development grant, and it'll be completely based on the rank score. But no province will be able to have four business case development grants, so the max is three. Um, for the business case development grants, like I said, there's going to be 10 in total, and it's $100,000 each for one year. Even though this is for, there are no match funds required at this stage. And the business case development grants um, are really going to be used, like I said, to do all of that um, outlining of the metrics that you uh, want to look at, working with the payer to to figure out the value and the timing of the payback and really to get all these um, agreements and contracts uh, done. There's also, um, if you'd like to do feasibility studies in this time, you're more than welcome to do that as well. There will be a strengthening workshop that is mandatory for all, um, all teams that have a business case development grant. And these are, this workshop is really to look at um, different ways to do adaptive complex interventions. And I think what will be really um, beneficial for the teams looking at the financial and the legal framework. So, you know, doing these business cases and outlining the agreements are probably new to most people. So if we can have all the 10 teams maybe like working together and sharing ideas, we thought that would be uh, hugely helpful. 
And then finally, we have the last stage, so uh, phase three, which is the ICT Rewarding Success Team Grant. Um, it says April 2019 here, 2019 here and, and I will just point out that's actually when the funding starts. So um, the application uh, will be available, obviously, be before then. Um, and there is a total of $24 million for five grants over four years. And this is really um, money to implement the actual interventions that you, you've worked on throughout the whole year previously and put them into like the healthcare system and do this evaluation and really kind of go through uh, the whole, the whole um, intervention and project. So, as I mentioned, a redirection um, of, the, of the possible funds uh, would happen, and it could happen at the end, uh, or it could happen throughout the four years of, of the intervention, depending on how you set up your agreement. There is one-to-one -one matching required, so just to um, uh, go through just those numbers a little bit. It's $24 million total. That's actually $12 million from CIHR. That needs to be matched, uh, obviously, one-to-one, -one, so another $12 million total for partners. But that ends up equaling, uh, I think, for each team, if I'm doing my, my mental math, we'll have uh, a total of $1.2 million per year. So 600000 would have, from CIHR, 600000 would be partnered. And then just to explain, there's five grants and there's four participating provinces. So again, each province will get one of these ICT rewarding success uh, team grants. And then what will happen is the next top ranked um, uh, uh, um, application will then get another team grant. So one province will be able to get uh, two of these. So I, I did see a few questions come in, and I'm sorry they, they pop on and off my screen fairly, fairly quickly, um, but I think we were going to uh, wait till the end to answer questions, but I would be happy uh, to answer uh, any questions, so thanks. Thanks so much, Jessica. So yeah, there were two questions that came in. Um, that's a, a nice little reminder for everybody on the call. If you have any questions around what you're hearing today, we welcome you to use the chat function. You'll see uh, an icon in the top right-hand area of your screen. Just click that. Type your question. You can send it to everyone, or you can send it to me as the host. Either will work just fine. And we'll entertain those at the end of the presentation. So feel free to use that chat function. Uh, and now I think we're going to go over to Heather Davidson. If Heather sorted out her audio issue, Heather, are you able to hear us? Yes, I am now on the call. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you fine. So just give me one moment Great. here and I'll load up your slide. Give me one second. Great, thank you. So I apologize. I don't have um, a camera on my computer here, so you can't see me, which is probably for the best. But. Um, <laughs> You can see, yeah, you haven't got them up yet. Let me know when you've got the slide up. Almost. One more second. There we go. Okay, so um, these are the priorities for um, BC, and where these priorities came from was, this is from the strategic um, health sector agenda that, it, that the ministry in collaboration with the health authorities and um, the physicians are implementing in the province right now. These, the specific wording of these ones was actually um, under a previous, the previous government, but just to speak to the, you know, the enduring nature of these and, and over the time frame of the, um, of this proposal, we don't anticipate that we will have solved any of these issues over the next um, four or five years, although we hope to make significant progress and hopefully this project will enable us to do this as well. Um, but basically the new government, under the new government, the priorities remain the same, slightly, the wording is slightly modified. So, you know, improving primary and community care and particularly access to primary and community care and really strengthening that system is a key priority for the province under the new government the key populations of interest, um, but uh, of particular interest are 
um, frail seniors and mental health and addictions, people with mental health and addiction issues, um, improved access to surgical services, and then um, the accessibility of services in rural, remote, and First Nation communities. We added the fourth one, which is not precisely a priority under the, under the strategic agenda, but there is an interest in innovation and the idea of innovative technologies or serve, and technologies writ large, not just gidget, you know, gidgets, gadgets and widgets, but it could be innovative service delivery programs that would facilitate um, patient-centered team-based care and really help patients get access to services and information. So the fourth one is really um, on the innovation front. So, so those are the priorities. As I said, um, in the way that our strategic agenda is formed, all of the health authorities are required to work on these um, within their region, so they will all be doing something in, in these areas. Um, and um, I, again, at the end, I guess when we're taking questions, happy to answer any questions about, about these, um, these areas. They're pretty broad. Um, but I think they speak to the, the key challenges we're facing in the province right now in, in trying to transform our healthcare system. That's it. Great, thank you so much, Heather. And just bear with me while I um, work some magic here. So um, I think we're moving over now to Chad. If we could, Chad, are you ready to share your slides? Sure, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you and you're just receiving the presenter ball now. You should see it and you'll uh, be able to sh uh, click the share screen icon. Do you see that there? Perfect, thank you. Perfect. Thank you, Pat. So um, what I'll be doing is that I will be going over the uh, key section of the funding opportunity that will um, essentially that are critical for the success of your application. And um, however, uh, I would like to make sure that you understand that uh, although I will be, uh, I'm only providing a summary and I strongly encourage you to please read the details that are in the funding opportunity. And if ever you have any questions, you can contact the CITR contacts uh, center uh, and their contact information is listed in the funding opportunity as well as at the end of this slide deck. And so the key uh, section that I was thinking of going over today um, were pretty much sort of the objectives but uh, Jessica already summarized them fairly well. However, they're pretty important for um, uh, to keep in mind whenever you're submitting your application. Uh, I will we'll be going over the eligibility section. Uh, then we'll spend some time to discuss review, so the relevance review process uh, that CHR will be using, and then uh, we'll touch on the priority exercise that each provinces will be going through for their idea brief. And then we'll uh, spend a few minutes to discuss peer review at the idea thon. And uh, finally, we'll finish with the uh, how to apply section and the instructions for submitting your application through ResearchNet. So, as I mentioned, the objectives were uh, pretty well summarized uh, by Jessica. So, uh, the only thing that I will uh, mention on uh, that note is that uh, the evaluation criteria for the idea of SON are essentially based to support and assess uh, the uh, feasibility of the team to meet those objectives. So, I encourage you again to take a detailed look at the writing and the objectives, and if ever you have any questions, to please send them uh, to contact uh, our contact center and then we'll um, help you navigate that. In terms of the eligibility criteria, so um, anybody essentially can come up with the idea that will eventually be pitched at the idea song. However, for the purpose of submitting the idea brief, we ask that the individual be identified as an, either an independent researcher or a knowledge user. So as a rule of thumb, an independent researcher is someone that hosts an academic appointment while the knowledge user is essentially uh, almost everyone else. Um, however, there is a definition in the funding opportunity in terms of what consists of a knowledge user. So again, I encourage you to take a look at it. So um, irrelevant of the role that is being picked, the nominated principal applicant will need to be uh, appointed at an eligible institution. And so there is a link also in the funding opportunity that will take you to a CHR page that lists uh, requirements for an institution to be deemed eligible to hold CHR funds. 
There's also a link that will take you to a page that lists all the institutions in Canada that have received approval to administer CHR funds. Uh, there is a sex and gender-based analysis training module that will need to be completed. So there are three that are available online. However, only one needs to be completed, and uh, the one that needs to be completed is the one that is most pertinent to your application. And uh, you need, you'll need to budget approximately 40 minutes to complete the module. And then another key point is that the team must consist of at least four principal applicants and or principal knowledge users. At the very least, you'll need to have a, a clinician, a researcher, a decision maker from a healthcare delivery organization, and a patient. Um, the nominated principal applicant can be counted as one of those. Um, however, you can also have multiple individuals that are uh, covering um, each of those perspectives, but you, at the minimum, you will require one individual identified for each of those. Uh, in terms of the uh, review process, so the phase one consists of the submission of an idea brief. And so there's technically two phases for this review process. So the first phase consists of the relevance review conducted by CHR internally. And essentially the um, objective of this process to make sure, make sure that the idea brief uh, meet the objectives uh, uh, listed in the funding opportunity. Um, to ensure that the ICT methodology uh, is actually being used and also into the two specific areas that have been posted in the FO, and also to make sure that the SPORE principle, such as patient engage engagement, is being respected. So the idea brief that actually uh, passed this uh, relevance review process will then be sent to uh, the Ministries of Health and the support units for a prioritization exercise. So those idea briefs will be um, reviewed against four evaluation criteria that are listed here. So essentially the relevance of uh, the project to the provincial priorities, uh, the quality of the idea, the likelihood that the project can be um, implemented within the four-year funding window, as well as uh, the likelihood that um, uh, the team can successfully implement and measure the cost effectiveness uh, that will arise from uh, the program. In terms of the Ideathon uh, peer review, so which will take place on February 6th and 7th, 2018 in Ottawa, uh, there are essentially four main criteria that you'll need to keep in mind. So the peer review panel uh, will essentially um, assess the pitches against innovation, scientific strategy, team and operations, as well as the budget. And when we say budget, it's essentially to make sure that the idea that's being pitched is feasible within the budget that's being requested. Um, so I will spend uh, no time on the sub-criteria under each evaluation criteria. I encourage you to read them in detail. And once again, if you have questions, please contact the CHR Contact Center. In terms of the how to apply, so a two-page idea brief will be submitted. And so there's a description here uh, as well as in the funding opportunity as to the information that we ask you to incorporate into your proposal. Uh, and again, a reminder that uh, the successful proposals must be able to uh, cover the uh, objectives uh, as well as the uh, research priorities that are listed in a funding opportunity. And then in addition to that, there are additional documentation and instructions that are provided. So mainly that um, the nominated principal applicant will need to submit a common CV. So it will either be an academic CV or a knowledge user CV, depending on the role that was selected at the beginning. Each principal applicant and principal knowledge users will be asked to submit a bio sketch. Now, uh, for the purpose of the idea brief, we ask you to only include individuals that are providing significant intellectual contribution to the project. So collaborators, for example, and co-applicants uh, will only be identified at a later phase. For now, we only want to understand who are the people that will be, have, have a principal role on your application. Uh, the individual that's been identified as the principal knowledge user that's a patient will uh, be required to submit a written statement instead of a biosketch CV. Uh, the a participant table will need to be incorporated to identify uh, the individuals uh, on the team, um, and this table will actually be used to assess um, the eligibility of your team composition. So please make sure that this, this table is accurate. 
Um, we will ask you to also provide a profile of each payer that is involved on your team. Um, and so a simple paragraph uh, for each of them will suffice. The sex and gender-based analysis certificate that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there are specific in instructions that were recently added to the funding opportunity because uh, the certificate that will be generated needs to be um, toyed around with a bit in order to be properly uploaded into ResearchNet. So please take a look at that. Uh, and finally, a budget breakdown needs to be submitted, so one for the travel of uh, which will support the team members to attend the Ideathon, as well as for those that are successful uh, at the Ideathon, um, we ask you um, in anticipation to submit a business case development grant budget. And this is the budget that essentially will support your pitch at the Ideathon. So in terms of the key dates, so the funding opportunity was launched in September. And the idea briefs will be due on November 21st. The uh, review process of so the relevance review and the prioritization exercise will take place until December 21st. By December 21st, uh, the, we expect that the applicants will be made aware of the outcome of the process. And then those that are successful will attend the Ideathon event in early February. And finally, those that are successful at the Ideathon will receive a business case development grant with a funding start date of March 1st. So finally, um, as I mentioned, uh, here are a couple of links. Um, so if ever you have any questions in regards to uh, the details in the funding opportunity, uh, please contact CHR support. Of course, I'm available at the end of this webinar uh, to answer any questions that are arising from my, my presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you, Chad. And I see there are more questions coming in. Just a reminder, if you feel you would like to uh, pose a question, please use the chat function at the kind of blue box in the top right area of your screen. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to turn the microphone over to our executive director here at the BC Support Unit, Minnie Downey, who will talk about supports for applicants through the BC Support Unit. Minnie? Thank you, um, Pat and Heather and Chad and Jessica. Um, so we see this as a partnership between the support unit and our research team. Um, with respect to putting the, uh, the initial step of the, the letter of intent in, um, we have our regular support that we would be providing to research teams, and people can access that onto the BC Support Unit uh, uh, website. Uh, there's a very simple form that, that you can fill out for services, but they would include support for methodology, um, patient engagement. The one thing that we're not offering that we normally offer is letters of support. So letter of support is not required from the support unit. It is a given that all applicants will be working with a support unit. So any of the successful applicants, we will be supporting you. So you don't need to reach out to us for letters of letter of support. Uh, because the reviews are actually being done here in the province, uh, we are ensuring that uh, we, we monitor conflicts of interest. So some of the services that we normally, uh, normally would provide, we may not be able to provide, but I suggest that anybody who's looking for support from the support unit as a part of putting their application together, please, please do reach out to us. Once we have a triage down to the five uh, applicants that will be going to Ottawa in February for the ideathon, we will work with you to help uh, and strengthen your application, and we will be organizing in late January a mock ideathon where we will bring together the different teams and go through a run through based on what, um, what the criteria is going to be in Ottawa. So we want to help and, and support all of our teams to be as strong as possible in going forward. And then after the two and hopefully three, people get the, uh, the initial grant, uh, we'll continue to work with you in areas that, that you would identify that you would like to have supported. We'll also be working with CIHR because they will be, as Jessica had mentioned earlier, they will be providing some uh, services as well. So that's the services that uh, we have to offer both at this stage and ongoing. And uh, we're really excited to be partnered with all teams um, at this level as well as the ongoing level. Great, thank you, Denny. Uh, 
We're going to move over now to the uh, question and answer portion of our day. I'm going to stop sharing the screen so that you're able to see questions if, as they come up. Uh, and I'll read them aloud for those of you who are on the phone alone, uh, or on the phone alone, not on the WebEx side, not alone in the room by yourself. Um, we've had a little consultation here, and uh, we realized that we're getting a nice, nice collection of questions here, so we're going to use these to populate an FAQ on our website, just so you're aware that that will be coming. So the first question is, when you say the LOIs will be sent back to the province, who will be doing the review exactly? Will this be the Ministry of Health? Um, I can take that one. So here in the support unit, in working with the Ministry of Health, we are currently putting together the review panel team. And once again, as I mentioned earlier, conflict of interest is a high priority for us. And we have engaged with uh, Stephen Lewis, who will be the chair of uh, this review panel. Thank you, Minnie. Uh, the next question is, will you be looking for partnerships with other provinces? If yes, what would you ideally like to see? Um, I'm Good. Is that Jessica? It, it was. I just didn't know if you wanted, if it was from, I wanted to clarify, but from a CIHR perspective or the BC perspective? Well, why don't you take the, the CIHR perspective and then we'll start there. Sure. Um, so we've actually had a few questions about this and about um, what happens with, if, with partnering from uh, individuals from provinces that are participating in rewarding success and provinces that are not. So just in terms of, um, and of the evaluation and how that will happen, uh, you can partner with anyone outside of BC, whether uh, they are in Ontario and, it's, and they are not participating, or Alberta and, and they are participating in rewarding success. But I do just want to highlight that if when you go, um, when you submit your LOI, you have to select which province um, the idea brief is going towards, and that is the only province that will be evaluating um, the idea brief. So just to highlight, even if you have individuals from outside of BC, there will be no evaluation from outside of uh, BC. So that's it. Yeah, no, I think Jessica has covered it there. So who asked the question? Um, if we have not covered it, then just please, please let us know. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Jessica. The next question is, you mentioned that the grants need to use the innovative clinical trial methodology. Does that mean research questions using non-experimental designs are then not eligible to apply, given some research questions that meet the MOH priorities may not be amendable to this design. I can uh, take that one. Or Chad, uh, did you want to? Uh, yeah, I could take a first crack at it. So um, as I mentioned, um, there is a relevance review process uh, that will ensure that the proposals that are submitted meet uh, those four principles. And one of them is the innovative clinical trial method. And so the project does have to meet that expectation. There, is, um, there are links on the CHR website. Uh, I believe they are listed in a funding opportunity that can provide you with examples of what an innovative clinical trial is. Um, Jessica, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, that was it. I just wanted to highlight um, to really go and please check the links in the funding opportunity um, because I think uh, they're pretty clear and more may be um, accepted within innovative clinical trials than you, you would think. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not super limited. So please just check the links. Thank you, Jessica and Chad. The next question is, can there be several payer partners or only one? If more than one, do all payer partners have to be identified for the idea brief? I can take this one. Um, there can be more than one uh, payer partner. That's um, definitely not an issue. Uh, for the idea brief, at least one needs to be identified. If you have identified more than one, 
great. Um, you can definitely include that in the IDEA brief as well. Only one payer partner can attend the idea song, so it's um, highly suggested that it's, it's the most prominent uh, partner that, that attends. And just to note that also that there are no actual letters of support required at this stage for, um, from the, the payer partner, but that those uh, will be required only for um, teams that uh, receive a business case development grant and they will have up to three months to submit those. So we understand that getting payers um, involved may take a little bit of, of time and they may change over a little bit over the next uh, couple of months. So just know that uh, it's really only three months after the business case development grant that it will have to be completely solidified with a letter of support. Thank you. Next question is, uh, can the same payer go to the IDEA fund to represent more than one team? I can take that one again. Um, I would say yes, especially um, if the ministry is, is the payer on, on more than one team, then, you know, I think that absolutely. Um, but I think the payer, sorry, a little bit of feedback, um, to also understand that if, um, as the teams move forward, they have to, if they're representing that team, if, if these three teams are successful, they need to then support those three teams. So that should be highlighted to them. Great, thank you. Uh, the next question is for BC, is urgent care center a new government interest a part of the priority? I can answer that, that yes. I think that that's included um, under primary care. I would include it under there. So yes, that would be um, considered as, as related to our strategic priorities. Great, thanks Heather. Next question is Jessica mentioned that the evaluation of the intervention has to be done by a third party. Does that mean that the organizations associated with the research team's clinician, academic researcher, patient partner, and payer are automatically not allowed to do the evaluation? Um, the short answer would be yes. Um, and the reason is, is strictly, again, con you know, just avoiding conflicts of interest. I don't think the, you know, if you're getting to contracts and agreements between the team and the payer, um, the team may not be comfortable with the payer doing the evaluation and the payer may not be comfortable with the team, uh, you know, doing the entire, uh, an audit. So, uh, I think a third party, um, uh, represent, like, rep yeah, an entity would have to, uh, do this evaluation. And this is something that as we start planning for phase three, I think CIHR will start to work with the support units to, to see how we can help, uh, you know, in, in doing some of that evaluation. But there's, there are no guidelines around that yet. Um, and this is, this is Minnie. Um, so, so Jessica, if the, if the team wanted to do their own internal evaluation, they, they could go ahead and do that, but, um, but there will be an external one as well. Is that correct? That is correct. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, next question is, what's the composition of the BC Review Committee to vet BC letters of intent, or would the LOI be vetted through a national review committee? BC letters of intent. I can take a stab at it, and I don't know, Chad, if, if you want to come in here as well, but uh, the letter of intent, as, as um, I think Chad had noted earlier, they will go to the CIHR and they will do the initial just screening and then it will come to the support unit. And in the support unit, we're using um, um, a makeup, the review panel will be a makeup of patients, decision makers, and uh, researchers. And looking at it from the lens of, of um, conflict of interest, 
we will be seeking people that will be removing them from the conflict of interest phase um, in reviewing these. We're very, very sensitive to the fact that this is being reviewed within the province um, and, and uh, um, obviously there's, there's a lot of people that will be in conflict, so they will be excluded from the review process. Anything to add to that? No, no. Okay, great. Next question is, uh, thanks, Nadine. The next question is, would letters of support from other organizations, not the support unit, be accepted, and if so, when? At the LOI phase, at the idea ideathon phase, or at the business case development phase? I can take this one. Um, so, uh, it can be accepted at the idea brief stage. There is um, space in the uh, idea brief submission for appendices uh, that goes up to 10 pages, so those could actually be incorporated there. Um, however, there's no requirement to have those ready here. They definitely, well, I shouldn't say definitely, but most likely those would be uh, would be requested at the phase three uh, for the full team grant. Uh, and I wanted to also um, clarify that uh, although there's no formal application that would be submitted uh, before the idea fund by those that are successful at the idea brief, there may be additional instructions that are sent to the six full applicants as to some type of basic information that will be shared with the peer review panel. So um, there might be a possibility that um, examples of uh, support from the community be something, a requirement that would be shared with the review panel. Uh, however, if that's the case, it would be shared to the successful applicants once uh, they uh, know the outcome of the uh, prioritization exercise. Thank you, Chad. Clarifying the letter of support question, would non-payer letters of support, e.g. an NGO, an industry partner committed to work together, be useful, and if so, at what stage, after LOI and before ideathon? And I think pretty much my answer covers that question, too. Okay. Thank you. Next question is, could you speak to the external evaluation process and what it will entail? Jessica, would you like to take this one? And so I'm assuming this is the third party about evaluation. Just want to clarify, and or maybe I can just add to that. And if it's not, the then answer, um, the answer to that question is yes. Okay, great. So uh, as I previously mentioned, this there's no guidelines for this um, yet. So this is something that we will work through. This is something that the successful teams will likely hear about um, at that um, strengthening workshop that, that all the teams will be present for. Um, this is obviously um, a pilot. This is the first time we're experimenting with this type of idea. And, and the rationale may be just to explain, uh, like I said, there would, could be conflicts and we're dealing with a possible payback if um, the team is successful and we would just want to ensure um, that everything you know that would that everybody agrees. So thinking that there would be a third party that would do that part of the evaluation, we thought would be helpful. Exactly how this will work, um, like I said, we will work out over the next few months um, uh, with the support units just to get their input as well. And successful teams will hear about it, um, uh, you know, uh, pretty soon after um, they, they know that they're that they are successful with the business case. So I think all of those um, types of, of questions, the same thing on how to build a business case, it's that same thing that we'll, we will all work out together. Great, thank you, Jessica. Next question is, will the support unit staff slash patients slash researchers who are on the review panel come from all of the different regions? Um, well, not looking at it so much from a region perspective, I think it's more from the perspective of ensuring that we've managed that conflict of interest and that uh, people on the review panel have a very good understanding of the province, the different regions, and uh, the priorities uh, distributed amongst the province. So the, we actually don't have the panel in place yet. But that's the lens that we're applying. Um, so we're, we're not necessarily looking at any geographical region, but we are looking for a level of diversity and understanding of the province as a whole, 
so certainly looking at the um, outside of, you know, in the more rural areas, that, that's actually one of the priority priority area. Okay. Next question, to confirm, for the letter of intent, there should be a budget outlining the travel costs for the IDS on, and also a budget for the business case development, question mark. How detailed does the latter budget need to be at the letter of intent stage? So, uh, yes, correct. Uh, we require two budgets, so one for the uh, travel budget for the IDS on, and the other one for the business case development. And so for the business case one, uh, we, um, we acknowledge that it may be a bit difficult to try to plan so far ahead about the type of information that would uh, be incorporated. However, we essentially ask you to, um, to essentially enter any, uh, as much as information as you have available to date in terms of planning. So it's still a good opportunity for you to plan for what's coming up and whatever you um, already have in mind, please put it in the document. And also a reminder that this is the information that uh, the peer review panel at the IDS on will be uh, looking at uh, in order in terms of um, uh, supporting the uh, activities leading up to the phase three uh, launch. And so uh, just keep that in mind whenever you're preparing your budget that essentially uh, you'll have to incorporate information that will support uh, your pitch at the IDS on. Thank you, Chad. Next question is, can a healthcare decision maker also be the payer? I'd say yes. In other words, can they come from the same organization? I'd say yes, but uh, Chad or Jessica or Heather? Jessica, want to take it? Sure. I would, I would actually agree with, with what Minnie just said, um, because often the decision maker in the healthcare organization is the payer. The healthcare organization is the payer. So, anyways, I, I would agree with that. Uh, it's Jessica. I would agree, and but I just want to um, highlight when also um, when we say payer, at least at the idea brief stage, we are looking just to make sure you don't need to actually have a, an individual's name. That there needs to just be the organization listed. Um, but obviously that organization then needs to be represented at the IDEAthon um, with a person. So I think uh, it, it, can, it definitely can be, but just want to highlight that you don't need a uh, an individual name at the moment. Thank you, Heather and Jessica. The next question is, is there an intention for making this a regular funding opportunity if the rewarding success pilot is successful? And if so, when would the next round of competitions be launched? Chad, you know. Uh, um, so from at my end, uh, my understanding is that this is um, the only call that's being planned to date. Um, and Jess, did you want to add to that? Uh, no, I, I think that's the case. This is, um, uh, yeah, very experimental. And as of now, it's, it's the only um, call plan to, yeah. Thank you, Jessica and Chad. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, I see there are more questions. So we've got a comment uh, that I believe is not a question, and it is, my work in the health authorities with regards to the four priorities was usually four plus one, the other being patient and family-centered care. So by the MOH slide, that's Ministry of Health slide, that has not been identified as a priority. However, would it be appropriate to focus on that? Here's a question. I, would, um, I think that we view the patient-centered care as an overarching theme. So I would, I would um, and by virtue of the four being patient-oriented research, I would assume that patient-oriented care would be part of any of the proposals that were related to these strategic priorities. Thanks, Heather. Next question, I heard that there was a province that might have dropped out of this round of competition. If this is true, would that funding, al that funding allocated to that province now be distributed to fund additional pros proposals from other provinces? Uh, yeah, so I could uh, take this one. Um, so effectively, one province did um, uh, drop out of the competition, and it was the province of Saskatchewan. And so we did do a realignment of the funding. 
so essentially what happens is that for the phase one, which is the idea brief, we are increasing the number of successful proposals from four to five. Um, and then uh, for the idea fun, originally the plan was to support two um, proposals. However, now that has been increased to up to three. Uh, and then uh, per province. Uh, and uh, also for the uh, last phase, the plan would be to, originally the plan was to have one um, proposal submitted for, pro supported, sorry, per province. However, now there's an opportunity to, uh, for each province to perhaps uh, support up to two proposals. Thank you, Chad. Any other questions from our audience today? Ask Katie twice, any other questions? Any, uh, any thoughts occurring to anyone? Third time, any other questions? Seeing none then, I would like to thank our guest presenters, Jessica and Chad from CIHR, Heather Davidson from the Ministry of Health, Minnie Downey from the BC Support Unit. Uh, we will have an FAQ up on our website probably within the next uh, couple of working days, I'm going to say. Uh, thank you, Kendall, for your excellent and thoughtful questions. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in today. And uh, the recording of this will be up on our website, uh, likewise, within the next couple of days. So uh, best wishes to everyone in this competition. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you. Is it the CIH or the support website? It's the support unit site. Yeah.